morning, everybody. It's nice to see you. Thank you for waiting on the line. Uh, so three quick things about me. I'm Amy Webb. How many of you were here last year? Just clap and make me, just clap. It'll make me feel better. Thank you. It's a nice welcome. Uh, so I'm a quantitative futurist. I'm a professor of strategic foresight at the NYU Stern School of Business. Most of my time is spent doing uh, research in my office. Occasionally, I come out in public and, and show our research to other people. I'm the founder of the Future Today Institute. Uh, we work with all different kinds of companies on their futures and strategy all around the world. So those are big Fortune 500 companies. Uh, we work with parts of the federal government, uh, the military. Uh, we might work with some of your governments, depending on who's here in the room. Uh, thirdly, if I've done things correctly, there should be a Twitter back channel that's running, and hopefully, if I've done this right, I'm live tweeting from the presentation. So if you follow hashtag TechTrends2019, as I'm showing you all of our research, I'm also tweeting out where all of the data and other things are coming from. So go ahead and follow along. I'm Amy Webb, uh, at Amy Webb on Twitter. Now, three quick things about you. Uh, you could be doing other things this morning. You've all self-selected to be here, which means that you're already paying attention to emerging trends and technology, which means that some of the research that I may show you is going to seem potentially a little familiar, but I can guarantee you that you're going to see it in a new way. You all play a vital role in shaping our future, uh, and I believe that you have the power to create the best possible futures for all of us. So to that end, I'm giving you a bunch of stuff to take home today. So everybody in the room is going to get a copy of our report, and a ton of other research, and everything is open source. So the research, the report, all of the stuff that's in the folders that you're going to get is open source, which means I want you to take it and use it and tear it apart and build on it and make it your own. At some point, give us credit as the source where it originated. Um, but this really is yours. And the only way that we are going to get to a place that we're all happy in the future is if we're all making smarter decisions in the present. That is why all of this stuff is open sourced and as of a few seconds ago, online for anybody to download and use. Thank you. <laughs> all right, so uh, this is the 12th annual edition of the report. Uh, it's been seen as of this morning by seven and a half, uh, we've had seven and a half million cumulative views over the years. So this, the report's all over the place. Um, and this year, it's a lot bigger. So we included 48 futures scenarios. Sometimes when you're looking at emerging technology trends, if you don't see them in a broader context and you can't visualize what might happen as the future wears on, you won't take any action. Therefore, we've put together 48 futures scenarios. 17 are optimistic, 20 are neutral, and 11 uh, involve catastrophic risk. We also included five non-technical primers because there are a lot of smart people running your companies and the places where you work, and they're making very difficult decisions on things like artificial intelligence and blockchain and genomics and extended reality and self-driving cars, but they don't necessarily have the technical knowledge um, or a broad enough understanding. So we wrote these primers specifically for non-technical people to help them get up to speed more quickly. So these are good pages you can rip out and share with your teams and the people that you work with. So this year, we have 315 tech trends spread across 26 industries. That represents a 30% increase from the number of trends that we had last year. And when I was putting all of these models together and we were mining all of the data and we were uh, mapping out patterns and you know, looking to see what the trends were, and I discovered that we were going to have a much bigger number this year than we did last year, and I told my staff, my staff was super, super excited uh, to get to work on this report. They were super happy, couldn't wait, really thrilled that it had grown this year. So it's big. It's really big, and I want to explain to you why, but first, let me contextualize what big means. So this was the computer that I had in college. It was a Toshiba Satellite Pro, kind of doubled as a self-defense weapon because it was so big. So the trend report print in its printed form is 5.6 pounds, which is about the size of this computer. Uh, so it's enormous, and there's a good reason for that. The reason that this trend report this year got so big uh, has to do with a few different important things that you should also know. 
First of all, there's been a convergence of lots of different technologies across areas that are typically siloed. Um, and that started to cause an acceleration of research in many different areas. Secondly, there were some big breakthroughs this year in some important key fields, places like artificial intelligence, uh, extended re reality, robotics, energy, uh, biotechnology, and also in places uh, like CubeSats and satellite technology in general. Of course, lots happening in space, uh, transportation, and also transportation itself. So none of these tech trends um, evolved in silos. They all played off of each other. And because of those key breakthroughs, we saw uh, inflection points across the board. Thirdly, uh, there were some important social factors that contributed to a lot of these tech trends starting to bloom. Things like changes in geopolitics, um, the introduction of regulation or the threats of regulation, or the lack of regulation, again, caused some change. And finally, consumer awareness. Many more people who don't normally pay attention to different technologies suddenly have an opinion on things like AI and workforce automation and transportation. So all of these things caused some big changes. So in the year 2019, there's a lot that you need to pay attention to, a, a lot of trends. And this is important because most organizations and most people, especially people who are experts in their field, tend to pay attention to the future in a linear way. So if you cover something like mixed reality or extended reality, you tend to be in a bubble, like most people do in their industries. So you're looking for key changes on a more micro scale. And the problem is that there are now influences coming from many different areas. So if you really want to understand the future of something like mixed reality or extended reality, you also have to pay attention to other areas like psychology uh, and data governance um, and, and lots of different other areas where there are complementary and adjacent trends that will cause the impact of this technology to shift and change as it moves forward. So I'd like to show you why that's important using a little thought experiment that we're going to do together. So why should a big box retailer like a Walmart pay attention to trends that are completely outside of retail, trends that would seem to have nothing at all to do with the retail experience? Things like gene editing, 4D printing, smart farms, and green technology. Why should Walmart care about all of this? Well, let's start with these non-retail trends, trends that seem to have nothing to do with their core business. And we'll start with genome editing. So uh, genome editing, which uh, has a lot of different names that don't necessarily mean the same thing, um, has been a pretty hot area of R&D, and a lot of people are talking about it, especially because we all heard that a Chinese researcher supposedly uh, used IVF and something called CRISPR to give birth to genetically modified twins. So most people heard this story. And of course, the entire world freaked out, as we do every couple of years when we hear some new story about CRISPR. Now, this may seem complicated, but all CRISPR is is a biological process with a little bit of human intervention. So uh, you go into the genome, uh, to the DNA, you snip out the part, uh, the, the part of the gene that you don't want, and then the rest is heritable. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily change, we don't think, um, the, the organism, uh, and it doesn't necessarily have downstream negative effects. Uh, and so if you think of something like mosquitoes that spread malaria, well, and malaria kills millions of people every, every year. So we can't wipe out the mosquito population because a lot of the rest of the ecosystem would die. But instead, if we could use something like CRISPR to take away the part of the mosquito that is capable of transmitting malaria, then the mosquitoes live on, everybody has food, and the humans are okay. That's what we're talking about here. This is a hot area of R&D. Uh, everybody in lots of different countries around the world, lots of different uh, companies and investors are now getting into this space. And again, it's about using different biological techniques to introduce genes that have a high level of precision and none of the undesired traits, as far as we know. But gene editing isn't just for people. So there's a really interesting company in Minneapolis called Recombinetics that are doing really interesting research on produce and livestock. 
And basically what they're trying to figure out is, given what we know to be true about the changing events and climate and other things around the world, can we create a better almond uh, that grows on a tree that requires significantly less water, that can withstand drought, that can withstand high heat, and, and things like that. Similar techniques have been used in Asia to create double-muscled pigs. So these are not intended as pets, or I mean, unless that's your thing, then I guess. Um, and double-muscled or quadruple-muscled uh, cows, for example, um, for consumption. And that has led to an entirely new area uh, of work and of business opportunities um, that relates to indoor plant factories. So indoor plant factories and also uh, outdoor micro farms. So um, there's a ton of really interesting new underground farms in Japan and China where they're using some of these new biological techniques in enormous spaces like warehouses that are 25,000 square feet where you would normally do your logistics and your boxes and stuff like that. Um, they're now growing lettuce. And so if you look over there, you can kind of see some people standing in the pink area that look like Oompa Loompas. Uh, um, those are researchers, and um, those are indoor farmers. And what's interesting, this is an indoor lettuce factory. Um, they are able to grow about 100 times more volume of lettuce per square foot than out in the real world, using 40% less power. They get 80% less food waste and use 99% less water. So it's much, much more efficient, and you don't have to have it outside. All right, so that's biology. Now let's switch over to that other trend that I mentioned, why should Walmart care about 4D printing? Um, 4D printing, if you're not familiar with it already, is 3D printing with the added element that after the thing has been printed, if you add a next element, like uh, water or a chemical or air, um, that whatever you have printed transforms one more time. So this is, some, it's an older project from MIT, and they've printed out a strand, uh, they've, they've uh, put some liquid uh, around it, and it continues the printing process, and it, in this case, forms MIT. Okay, so that takes us to green technology. Um, so there, you know, it, the weather's been a little weird, right, all around the world. Uh, er, last year there were fire natos in California. This is like a shark nato except with fire. Uh, and I have to imagine is terrifying <laughs> if you were to see one. I'm laughing, but this is horrible. Uh, we've, we've got drought, we have unpredictable weather patterns all over the place. Um, and the challenge is that all of that affects farming and where our food comes from. So this is some research from the National Academies of Science and the USDA uh, here in the United States, which has recently shown that our crop production in the US is no longer uh, sustainable the, using our old methods. Um, that's because our gr groundwater tables have started to change, fertile soil has started to change because of erosion, um, changing and extreme uh, weather patterns are messing with our natural abilities to do farming the, way the, the ways that we always have. And as a result, there are a lot of new solutions coming to place, things like new ways to block the sun and uh, new ways to create clouds to help mitigate all of this. Okay, so what does any of this have to do with Walmart? What do, what's the connection between all of these additional trends and Walmart, and quite frankly, every single person sitting in this room. The global food supply. Uh, and where all of our food is going to come from, not on, in the year 2200 when we're living on Mars, but much more likely in the year 2030, 2040, when we're dealing with real environmental catastrophes right here on Earth. So where, you know, we think about our, our food supply, we tend to think, you know, in the future, it'll come from the Amazon, which is rich and dense. Right, not that Amazon. <laughs> this Amazon. So let's look at some Amazon data. Amazon acquired Whole Foods in 2017. And the majority of Whole Foods here in the United States are in high-density urban areas that have a ton of large buildings. Large buildings, in many cases, with very large basements. 
So this is a quick map of where a lot of those whole foods are distributed throughout the United States. Okay, but uh, we also, as of last week, know that Amazon is most likely launching an entirely new grocery chain, not to obviate the work that it's doing at Whole Foods, but to expand. And as it happens, more of us are buying our groceries online than going to physical grocery stores. Uh, some of the projections that we've built show that online grocery sales could double in the next five years up to or possibly above $60 billion by the year 2023. That's an incentive to push this forward. Amazon is also in some really interesting areas of R&D. They're working on sensors. They've got R&D and investments in life sciences. And of course, robotics and logistics and warehouses. So if we connect all of these trends that your typical retailer is probably not paying attention to, what are the possible outcomes? Well, food of the future is grown from engineered seeds at indoor plant factories housed within the Amazon grocery store system in every one of our local communities. The implication of this is risk. Walmart uh, winds up having to compete where Amazon has significantly cheaper groceries grown nearby, uh, and Amazon not only kills Walmart, it kills big box grocery stores. Indoor plant factory to table is the new farm to table movement, which means we no longer need long distance produce shipping. So all of the trucking companies and logistics companies and the packagers and everybody else and the refrigerants that are used to get your celery, so for your celery juice, uh, from California to the East Coast doesn't need to exist anymore, which means Amazon not only kills traditional farms, it also kills trucking companies. And it's plausible that we would no longer need to import or export soybeans, beef, and wheat, which could mean that Amazon unintentionally reshapes the global political world order. <laughs> I appreciate the laughter. Some of you I hear sobbing towards the front of the stage. All right, but there's also some opportunity here, and that's the part that I'm interested in. The opportunity is how and where we get our food is going to need to change, not some time off in the distant future, but within our own lifetimes. If you are able to recognize those trends early and you can do something about it, develop smart strategy, you could wind up being the hero to both your company and to our community, which would be a great thing. You have to pay attention to technology and science trends that are inside your industry and also adjacent to it. And that is why our report is so damn big this year. So when you get home, uh, here's what you need to start doing. Uh, what is the connection between your company and whatever it is that you're doing, and not just the tech trends within your industry, but all of the tech trends within our report. You have to force yourself to continually make those connections. The name of the game here is not predicting the future, it's making connections so that you can see the future, the plausible future, more clearly. Now, you might be wondering, this is interesting, but when is all of this supposed Amazon global takeover and plant factories gonna happen? And uh, not just when, but like exactly what year? And what I would say to you is, uh, that is the wrong question. I know a lot of people want to know exactly the year and the date that certain things are going to happen, but that sets you up for failure. So one of the things that I strongly recommend to you and we do with our clients is to instead think in terms of strategic time horizons, okay? So basically, for the next couple of months, maybe the next 24 months, you should have a preponderance of quantitative data that you can look for. Uh, with more data, more evidence, and certainty, you can do tactical work. You can make tactical decisions about the future. But that must be in service of strategic planning, vision, and systems level disruption. So you can make your strategic uh, plan, which a lot of companies do in three to five year increments, but that should be done as you have less and less data in service of your vision for how you want whatever it is that you're working on to unfold. And that should be in service of not just how you, you want your company to look or your project to look, but in fact, how you want the world to function. So when I hear people say, there's too much change happening too quickly, we can't possibly plan out much more than a year 
or our company doesn't do anything longer than 24 months, what I say is that's a terrible idea. <laughs> You're wrong. Um, the best thing to do, because a lot of technologies are in flux, is to make the tactical decisions where you can, as long as those service things like your strategy and your vision and your ideas about what the world should look like. You have to, tack, tra to track tech trends in service of your farther futures. All right, quick note on our methodology, and then we'll get right to it. Um, so this is a methodology that we've developed over the past 15 years. Um, we don't do your typical scanning and looking for keywords and headlines. This is a very rigorous data-driven process. We rely on quantitative data where we can get it, qualitative data in other cases. And essentially what we do is uh, scrape up all this data. Uh, we run it through various different models and systems looking for patterns. Um, those patterns give us a sense of what the tech trends are. We then calculate their trajectory, uh, think about the strategic time horizons, and then build out scenarios. And the purpose of the scenarios is to make better decisions in the present. In the report, you're going to start seeing this on the screen, there are different pieces of information. Um, basically, what we're telling everybody is these are the key insights and what you need to know. Here's what's happening. Here's what we think is happening next. These are the companies and the people and the organizations to pay attention to. And finally, um, here's how we think you should think about taking action within your organizations. Now, trends evolve as they emerge. Nothing is linear. So as a re result of that, sometimes trends um, converge with other trends and become new things. Uh, they typically don't drop off of our list entirely. But what you will see in the corner is the number of years that we've been following whatever this thing is. Um, so in this case, microsats sats, and cubesats, we've been looking at now for four years. Um, and then finally, the worst possible thing that you can do is to look at a bunch of cool emerging tech trends and then go back to your day jobs. You have to get used to making incremental decisions on a very regular basis, daily, if you, if you can. So we have this action matrix along with every trend that tells you, you know, if there's a high degree of certainty or a lower degree of certainty and what kind of impact, whatever this thing is, um, that indicates to you whether or not you need to act now it's going to inform your strategy. You're going to keep vigilant watch because it's early, or we're going to revisit it later. So I want to highlight, because there's a lot in the report, what I'm going to do is highlight some key findings uh, from the report this year. And I'm going to do that by taking a deep dive into two uh, trend clusters. After I take that deep dive, I'm then going to show you some plausible, optimistic, neutral and catastrophic scenarios that describe what happens as these trends play out. Here's the first key finding. Privacy is dead. Welcome to South By. <laughs> uh, so privacy is dead. You should have no illusion that uh, you are a private citizen anywhere. Um, but the twist is that's not necessarily a bad thing. So there are 16 trends in this area. There's a lot to move through, so I've color-coded everything and just so that we can sort of all follow the dot as we go through before we get to the scenarios. Um, I'm going to sort of explain to you what all these trends are, and I'm going to connect them as we go. So last year, I, the first thing that I told everybody was that um, it was the beginning of the end of smartphones. Um, and one of the things that we looked at were face prints uh, we looked at voice prints, uh, gesture technology, and generative adversarial networks. And so we're starting to see the convergence of a few of these different trends now in interesting new places. So this is the Byton, uh, this is called the M Byte car that's coming out in China later this year. And it doesn't have any physical keys. It doesn't even have a key fob. The way that you open up this door of this car and hit the ignition is with your face. Uh, so your face print is stored in a central registry, and it's stored within the car. And if your face is the wrong face, the car doesn't turn on. Um, in the cockpit, uh, it there's not a lot of buttons. So the whole thing responds to gesture and voice. And there's a smart camera that personalizes the infotainment system, again, by recognizing who is in the car and then giving those people access to different functions and, and entertainment when they're in the car. Some of you have probably seen this, but this is an update to Generative Adversarial Networks, or GANs. Um, so software engineer Philip Wang 
I think mostly sort of as a fun side project slash also to warn us about the future, um, created something called thispersondoesnotexist.com. And uh, these people don't exist. So this is an example of a generative adversarial network using NVIDIA uh, tools. And as you can see, it's, um, if you hit refresh on that website over and over and over again, um, it shows you faces of people and backgrounds, and they all look totally plausible. They look real. Um, and none of these are real people. These were all computer generated and are being done in microseconds, not with some big giant render farm somewhere. This is, I took this video sitting in my, my living room, uh, just hitting refresh over and over and over again. And that made some pretty big headlines, which of course spawned some memes and other implementations of the same technology. So this is called, um, this cat does not exist. And as it turns out, this project didn't go so well, but I thought it was worth showing you. Um, these cats are horrifying. That's the Beetlejuice cat. That's my favorite. All right. So that's sort of a quick, uh, here's what you missed from last year update. And now we're going to go into some of the newer trends that we're seeing this year, beginning with biometric scanning. I'm obsessed with this trend. I keep uh, finding really interesting new things in this area to follow. And I want to share with you a couple of really interesting projects. But for those of you who aren't familiar, when we talk about biometric scanning, what we're talking about is mining and refining and optimizing our biodata in real time to help other systems learn about us, categorize us, respond to us, and or report on us, like tattletale report on us. So this is a project from MIT's Effective Computing Lab and Kia Motors. Um, it's an emotion detection system, again, for the car. Uh, you sit in the car. It looks at your micro movements on your face and some other bio, uh, bio data. And it is real time uh, detecting what your emotional state is as you're driving your car. Ostensibly, this is to prevent road rage, right? So if you're in your car in the last days of humans driving cars and somebody is doing something that enrages you, uh, whatever it might be, the car is designed to quickly help alter your mood um, by changing the color scheme, blowing, I guess, cold air or something, whatever it is that makes you happy, uh, turning on Rage Against the Machine in my case, <laughs> uh, whatever it is. But basically, it's like altering the condition to help you experience more joy as you um, drive on extremely congested roads. Amazon is also working on biometric scanning uh, for the purpose of detecting our emotion. So this was a patent that they filed. And again, patents don't necessarily mean that whatever it is is going to actually enter the marketplace. But in this case, I feel pretty confident that it is. So <clears throat> uh, as you talk to Alexa, um, Alexa is creating a baseline of our voice. This is not yet happening. This is what they're proposing. So Alexa would detect our emotional and behavioral states. Um, and over time, uh, it would know whether we're manic, whether we're feeling a little depressed, whether we're amped up, <clears throat> whether we're happy, whether we're sad, whether many of you in the room are coughing and sneezing because you have colds. Uh, it's listening for tone of voice. And so it creates this baseline of our biometric data and then judges our likely emotional state as well as our likely physical state, whether or not we're sick, Maybe we've had a stroke and we don't realize it yet. And um, all of this is to help, again, understand more about us and probably to suggest cough drops or tissue if it thinks that we're sneezing and maybe have a cold. There's a lot of other interesting ways that our bodies are being recognized. So the US military um, has, is working on bone recognition. So you're out and about. And uh, the idea is uh, it's a dark place. Infrared is tricky. Um, this uses radar, to, which can penetrate the body without frying your tissue, probably. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and since it can't penetrate your bone, uh, once it, you know, you're, if you're in a database, it can detect that that is you specifically, or that you are a person uh, roaming around. Um, so bone detection is a thing, even without an MRI machine. It's just now, again, like radar. So it could be done in, you know, outside the convention center. And then, of course, genetic recognition. So just to placate me, 
How many of you have submitted your, how many of you have used like a 23andMe or an Ancestry.com or a, yeah, that's what I thought. So you all have voluntarily submitted your biometric data to a third party so that you can find out what percent Irish you are. Uh, and, um, and what's interesting about that is at the moment there's not a lot of rules and regulation around what can be done with that bio data at a later date. Which is why we are starting, now, now I'm going to scare the hell out of everybody who just raised their hands. Uh, <laughs> Um, which is why we are starting to see both calls for and new initiatives, this is another trend, in universal genetic databases. So law enforcement loves this idea of universal genetic databases where all your biometric data is put into one spot, uh, whether it's your bones or your brains or your blood or other things that start with a B having to do with your body, um, and, uh, and, and you can basically be tracked. Um, there's a rush to both buy and house our genetic data all around the world um, and to structure it to make it easier to search. Now, there are some really good medical reasons for this to be done. So folks in the medical research space would definitely benefit from having wider pools of data voluntarily submitted. On the other hand, we've already started to see third parties using biometric data without informing us um, or without our consent. And some countries now, like Saudi Arabia, um, are trying to create universal genetic databases to track all of their citizens. And that brings me to wearables. So um, you, you all know what wearables are. Everybody in this room probably has something on them at this point, whether it's a connected watch, an iWatch, or a Samsung watch, or connected earables, uh, little Bluetooth headphones that uh, at the moment mostly play music and help you uh, play your phone calls, uh, take your phone calls, but pretty soon they're going to be connect or collecting biometric data as well from your ears. But there's a ton of new wearables coming to market this year. So smart shoes, smart belts, and even smart yoga pants. And all of these devices, again, create baselines. They monitor us in real time. They detect our physical movement. And then they uh, make suggestions. And the idea here is to nudge us into walking better, sitting better, downward dogging better, corpse posing better, whatever it is. And all of these trends, all of these trends feed into what are called persistent recognition systems, which is another key trend to pay attention to for this year. Persistent recognition is really interesting. Um, these are systems that take all of this bio data and are constantly um, learning from it in some way. And so this is a really interesting, again, patent, so it hasn't been built yet, but this is a new area of R&D for Walmart. This is a connected grocery cart. OK, so imagine yourself going into a Walmart. You take the cart. Uh, as soon as you put your hands on it, it creates a baseline of your biometric data. So what's your temperature? Uh, what's your heart rate? Uh, how, what's the pressure that you're holding down? Um, what's your speed? And it's monitoring all of this as you move around and shop at the Walmart store. And if it turns out, if your shopping cart senses that you are really angry that you can't find the Captain Crunch cereal, uh, or whatever it else might be, um, the shopping cart sends your data to a central location. Uh, and then that central location sends a note, a digital note, to a store associate and says, you know, crazy lady with insane looking hair on aisle four is about to go ballistic. Will you please go over there? Uh, and then the store employee comes over. And if it's me, I just get much more upset that somebody's trying to talk to me. <laughs> Persistent recognition. And all of that, all of these trends feed into another new trend that I have a feeling is going to interest a lot of people sitting in this room. And that is behavioral biometrics. So this is the first time this has made our list. And the reason for this is um, because, again, a confluence of different technologies making this technology possible. So what we're talking about is mining hundreds of unique biometric markers, creating all of these data points, comparing all of that against our individual baselines, using machine learning and deep learning to learn and understand specifically about us and not just our obvious behaviors that you can see, but what's going on inside our heads um, that you can't see. And then authenticating us or nudging us to some 
other activity or rewarding us or punishing us if we break some kind of rule. So um, we just went through all of those trends. There are two left, uh, and they may at this point be pretty uh, obvious to you because they have to do with data governance and regulation. So um, one question that every company that works with biodata is going to have to start thinking about is, well, who owns all of this? What does the data governance structure look like? What do we have to be thinking about? Um, how are we storing this data? Uh, even if you're a third party that plugs into it in some way, who's in charge of all of this bio data from all of us? Um, how is it being encrypted? Should it be interoperable? So there are, because a lot of the genetic databases like Ancestry and 23andMe, you can't port your, bio, your genetic data between those systems. So there are now open source registries where you can upload it to there and then use that data across sites, which like, uh, um, if, if a company goes out of business, can your data, your bio data be sold to a third party? Uh, and then should companies be in the business of data stewardship or data ownership? And finally, uh, regulation is definitely on the horizon for this year. Um, so we've already started to see a lot of GDPR copycats, um, which last year when I talked about splinter nets, the internet has become splintered. Uh, and that trend exists still uh, in 2019. Um, we're starting to see copycats around the world in different parts of this country, the state of California, trying to figure out how to regulate uh, the internet. And can you even imagine what might happen when people try to regulate and do stuff with all of our biodata? So the name of the game again is not predictions, it's connections. So what I'd like to do is take all of those trends, and I'm going to now show you the connective tissue between all of them. Uh, and once we do that, um, we're going to start having some questions. So the questions that are on my mind are, who owns this stuff? Who owns your biometric data? Should you have a right to keep your emotions private, to keep your mental state private, and your other biometric details private from persistent recognition? How can your organization or your company use all of this bio data safely and ethically? And then that should lead to some existential questions like, who actually owns your DNA? Stop and think about that for a moment. Because guess what? We don't have an answer to that question. And if we don't have an answer to that question, then the next question is, well, could I at least trademark my DNA so that nobody else can copy it or use it in some way? And if it turns out that I don't technically own my own DNA once it's outside of my body, then who owns my body and all the stuff in it? These, I know these sound like crazy questions, but we haven't yet started to think about them, and there are people all around the world who want to now create regulations without thinking this through clearly. So we all have some big decisions to make, and that is why we use scenarios. So it's not enough to just know that these trends exist. You have to take action on them in some way. You have to start planning with them. That's why we use, as futurists, data-driven scenarios. These aren't like cool sci-fi stories, although they may sound like it. These are data-driven scenarios to help us confront these questions, to help us confront deep uncertainty so that we can develop better strategy and prepare ourselves for the future in a better way. So as I mentioned at the beginning, there are three types of scenarios you're going to see. The first are optimistic. This does not mean utopian future where everybody is super happy. All this means is that we have somehow made the best possible connections using the data that we have available, and we have made the best possible decisions as a result. Therefore, the future should be better than it is now. It should be good. There are neutral scenarios, which is, well, what happens if we preserve the status quo? And finally, pessimistic or catastrophic, which is what happens if we, in fact, make bad decisions. So I started with the key finding. There's many in the report, but this is our key finding, which is privacy is dead. Uh, and let's see how all of this plays out over the next 15 years. So optimistic framing. Data collection is transparent. Uh, people understand how and when and where and why we are being recognized and monitored. It's the end of passwords. No more two-factor. It's amazing. If you lose your keys, totally fine. 
There's no boarding passes, no physical credit cards. You don't even need a wallet unless you really, really, really want to have one. Uh, you don't have to worry about driver's licenses. Biometric scanning is safe and secure. Technology enriches our lives. Privacy is dead. But we're OK with that. It's not a big deal. It's fine. Now here's the neutral framing. Turns out we preserve the status quo. Everybody doesn't really see that any of this is urgent or that we should do anything about it. We wind up seeing a ton of consolidation across the tech industries and all of the companies that are mining our data. Our biometric data gets locked into just a few different technology providers, which means that our data are not interoperable. But guess what? Neither are we humans <laughs> interoperable across systems. Turns out there's a lot of bugs because nobody's collaborating. Um, authentication becomes annoying, and we start getting hacked in new ways that nobody saw coming. And then finally, I think the reason many of you are here, is the catastrophic framing. Uh, companies uh, acknowledge what's happening. They, active, they don't want to collaborate. They don't want to deal with regulators and, or lawmakers in any way. They want to go it alone. So they actively work against protecting our biometric data. We have no idea where our data is or who even owns it. Regulation comes fast. Uh, splinter nets give way to protected biodata zones, which means that we have a hard time moving in between places. The cookies that you have to keep clicking on when you go to websites, that, that, that means that when we go to physical places, we're constantly having to authenticate and check in and make sure that it's OK, giving permission that, are, that we're being mined and refined and scanned. Uh, Walmart shopping carts can't cross state lines. There is a new economic and social class system, again, that nobody saw coming. Rich people can buy premium services to anonymize their biodata, but everybody else, they have their biodata mined and refined and productized. Authoritarian countries create universal genetic databases to monitor and most likely punish a lot of their citizens. So if I were to model this out, which I have, here's, here's, here's given where we are today, uh, I would say there's about a 10% chance of that optimistic framing happening, a 50% chance of the neutral uh, scenario happening, and a 40% chance of the catastrophic uh, framing happening. Okay. Why don't we look at some more cats? There's a little palate cleanser. So we'll just take a couple of these. Yeah. I'm not sure what that one is. This looks like intestines on the outside. That's terrifying. It's a cat human. OK, that's even worse. Uh, all right, so let's take our second little palate cleanser. Now let's take our second deep dive into the second area, the second key finding, and the second area of trends. Um, and the second key finding is that your home is way smarter than you think it is. And these are all of the different, there's fewer in this, this, uh, this area, so there's fewer trends we're going to go through, but I've also color coded them for you. All right, so as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, last year I talked to you about the fact that our uh, smartphones are, uh, well, this is the beginning of the end of smartphones, and um, I know Mobile World Congress happened, and I know everybody's very excited about these folding phones, which I think are interesting, but their core functionality hasn't changed. We're talking about a bigger phone that now folds. And um, by the way, you know, the numbers are still trending down uh, in terms of new penetration and adoption rate. Except for price, that number is going way up. So you can buy yourself a brand new phone that costs the same as five Toshiba Satellite Pros, uh, if you want. Now. It turns out that while we are all using our phones, we're not using them as much to talk to people. Instead, our phones are the connective tissue between us and other devices that surround us. We are not just talking to people, we're now talking to machines. So there's a Kohler toilet uh, that you can talk to. It has Alexa. You can go into your bathroom and tell it to put the seat up. Forget to tell it to put the seat down. Uh, but there are many, many other um, things that you can now talk to. So you can buy plugs uh, and tell the plug to turn on your light. Um, there's a smart garden hose. So you can walk outside, tell it to start watering your begonias, and I guess it will do that. Um, there's smart blood pressure monitors that you can talk to rather than having to squeeze it or do anything else. There's a Roomba that you can talk to. There's a... There's uh, the Nest thermostat that you can talk to. There are smart big appliances in our kitchens, like ovens and stoves. 
You can talk to your remote or just talk to your television rather than having to click on buttons. And of course, you can talk to your microwave oven. Uh, Alexa, uh, Amazon has debuted a microwave that you can now talk to. As it turns out, last year, uh, during the holiday season, 8% of Americans got some kind of smart speaker during the holidays. That's an extraordinary number of smart speakers that were sold. In fact, the total number of voice-powered devices increased 78% year over year in America, beating most analyst estimates. That was a huge number. And one of the models that, uh, one of the models that we built um, a couple of years ago seems to continue to hold, which is by the year 2021, uh, we still believe that about half of the interactions that you have with machines will be only using your voice. So that may not be as big of a surprise now that we see all of the opportunities to talk to machines. One of which, as, as I mentioned, is that microwave. Now, how many of you heard that Amazon has this microwave that with Alexa in it and you can, you can talk to it? So, so let me break this down for you and tell you what's going on here. There's a lot of people may be thinking, like how American is it? that you, you're so lazy, you can't push a couple buttons on your microwave to heat up your stuff. Why do we need to talk to our microwave? Well, the answer to that question has to do with data and popcorn. So once you order, let's say you subscribe to popcorn from Amazon and you have your monthly subscription and you get the microwave popcorn. Amazon knows exactly what's happening, and any online retailer does, um, with that popcorn up until the point that it's delivered to your home. Once it arrives at your house, you know, they no longer have any data. However, if you open up the box of popcorn and you put it in the microwave and you tell Alexa to pop your popcorn and you keep in mind all of the trends that I just talked to you about in the bio data section, Alexa not only knows who's popping that popcorn, but whether you're sick, whether you're healthy, um, what else you've popped and heated up that day, what time of day it is, who else is in the room. There's an, a lot of data. There's a wealth of information that's being shared by the simple act of you asking the microwave to pop your popcorn for you. Now, what happens when all of your devices can collect really granular levels of data on you and your families? Well, one of the biggest trends that we're covering this year has to do with home automation. And so a lot of us now are thinking mostly about smart speakers. But in fact, what happens when your entire home becomes a gigantic computing device, a big, huge computing environment? Your home continuously generates data and, and uses the smart devices um, in order to generate real-time information so that uh, tasks can be completed for you to make your life a little bit easier. So some of you may have Apple HomeKit uh, because all of the big tech giants have something now. So this is where, again, you can create a central nervous system for your home, plug in your lights, plug in your electric uh, drapery, whatever it might be, your locks, your security system. But again, you're generating a lot of data inside your home in order to make all of these things work. And appliances now have their own digital assistants, which is another big key trend that we're paying attention to. So Google, Amazon, and Apple all have digital assistants for appliances, but there are additional players in the system now, like Samsung. Uh, Samsung's Bixby is supposed to be in all of its devices by 2020, and of course there are other players coming to market. What we're doing here, what these systems are doing, are not just tracking you, but they're making it so that the machines can talk to each other. Uh, so it's tracking interactions data, it's responding to commands, and then using predictive analytics to anticipate your needs to try to make your life a little bit easier. All of this is intended to help us live more efficiently. But uh, it's also intended to help optimize our appliance energy use. So this one may seem like it's coming out of left field, but another key trend area in this space has to do with energy and energy use. So right now, similar to when, people, uh, when these companies deliver boxes to our house and then nobody knows what happens, energy providers know how much amperage that we're pulling from the system so they know what we look like on the power grid, but they don't have any other information beyond that. That's where the big tech companies come into play. They increasingly understand our data and our energy usage patterns, which means that they have way more granular data about our individual energy consumption and our utilities consumption, not just energy, than the utility companies themselves. And home automation isn't just about home appliances. 
This is going to blow your mind. So, um, so in America, uh, our biggest home manufacturer is called Lennar. Uh, and last, uh, like 18 months ago or so, Amazon partnered with Lennar, which is the biggest home builder in the United States, to create Amazon Homes. Now, this is not just about getting a brand new home and putting a couple of Alexas in it. The whole thing is automated. There are sensors everywhere. So we're talking about cameras outside and smart locking systems and smart surfaces and smart stoves and smart microwaves. A technician comes when you open up and move into your home to not only flip the switch, but to tell you how everything works. And you don't have to worry about tech support because if something is broken, they already know. Uh, and and you, can get, you can get help. And as it turns out, Amazon homes aren't just in the cool parts of Austin or in San Francisco. They're everywhere. Um, so this is where I grew up. I grew up on the southeast side of Chicago, technically called Northwest Indiana. Uh, and um, that's cool. That's fine. Uh, but, but I grew up in a really blue-collar neighborhood, so I would not call us like a, a, like a, a good natural location for lots of high technology and incredibly smart homes. There is literally a cluster of Amazon homes 10 blocks away from where I grew up. It blew my mind when I found this out. All right, so if we combine all of that with one last adjacent trend. Um, so, uh, so this is adjacent, but it's important. Big tech is also getting into healthcare. So, um, so all of the big tech companies in some way now have health initiatives that, um, that are pretty interesting. So uh, Apple is launching healthcare clinics. They're called AC Wellness, and they're intended for their employees. So these are on-site medical care systems, and it's not just about triage when you get sick. This is also about wellness, um, but that system plugs into the stuff that, we, that the employees wear. So you've got your Apple smartwatch. Uh, pretty soon when the AirPods come out that have the biometric uh, scraping capabilities, they might be wearing that. And this is to help uh, the healthcare system make sure that you're living your best life, your best uh, optimized life, get better sleep, stress management, healthier eating, Apple will help you with that. Uh, Google has been in healthcare, that, that sort of space, for a very long time. Um, previously, I think it was in the mid-2000s, uh, Google had something called Google Health, which was intended as a new kind of patient uh, management system that you could port and take with you so that you had a better sense of what your health data was. Google's got Google Fit, they've got Android systems, they've got watches, they've got phones, and of course, the brain division, which is one of Google's AI divisions, uh, is working on AI-powered systems for doctors and for hospitals. And then, of course, we all know about Amazon's healthcare plans. So there's the joint merger between Berkshire Hathaway, J.P. Morgan Chase. They're challenging incumbents on insurance, and they hope that the future of healthcare could look pretty different by the time that they're done. So now again, we have to make decisions uh, about all of this home automation. We have to contextualize it. We have to think about all of this in terms of our companies and also our personal data. So here are some data-driven scenarios, again, to help us see how all of this may play out in the future. And these scenarios cover the next 10 years. So this is for the year 2029. OK, so we started with, as it turns out, your smart home is way smarter than you think it is. And these were the different tech trends that we covered, uh, that were grouped together. So here's your optimistic framing. Our devices work across platforms. They are truly interoperable. Our families easily intermingle with Google, with Amazon, and with Apple easily. They help us save time. They help us be better energy consumers. Um, we are nudged into healthier lifestyles. Smart homes are safe and fun. Don't laugh cynically. All right. <laughs> I feel you. Neutral framing. We continue along this path without making a lot of big changes. We soon realize that, as it turns out, we can't just flip a switch and change providers. We can't change over our smart homes, our smart offices, our smart schools, operating systems, the same way that we used to change or try to change our mobile OSs. For those of you who have tried to switch between Amazon and Apple, Think of that in home scale or company scale. We're frustrated. We're spending way more money and way more time than we thought we were going to have to. And by the way, we have very little choice. 
And now for the catastrophic framing. You are living in either a Google Home, an, Apple's, uh, an Amazon Home, or an Apple Home, and so is all of your data. You have no idea or understanding of how decisions are being made about you and for you. And as it turns out, your smart homes are now making decisions for you that you yourself wouldn't make. The microwave, which is connected to your Fitbit and your smartphone and your smart stuff, decides that you should be on a diet and you don't get to pop that popcorn. <laughs> the washer decides that Austin's in a drought and you should be a better consumer of your utilities and you can probably get another day out of those jeans. And you, who lives a 10-minute walk to work, should be taking your bike, but you're feeling a little lazy today. And your garage decides that it's not going to let you open it up so that you can take your car. You get to walk to work. Your smart home is a smart prison, and there is no escape. You may be able to unplug your smart microwave, but you can't unplug your whole family from the system. That's right, that's right. Given the data and the evidence and what we are modeling and seeing today, I think there is a 0% chance of that optimistic framing happening, a 30% chance of the neutral framing, and a 70% chance that is catastrophic framing is what our futures look like. Let me end on this, all right? These futures haven't happened yet, OK? We're not robots living out somebody else's simulation. None of this has happened. The optimistic scenarios are possible. If they weren't possible, I wouldn't have had the data and the evidence and the model to write them. I believe they're possible. However, like a great marriage, <laughs> great futures take a lot of work. If you want a terrific future, one that you are going to be excited to live in, it's not just going to show up for you. Wonderful, amazing, happy futures, healthy societies, are the result of really, really hard work. They're the result of courageous leadership. They are the result of being flexible, of collaborating, of making inroads between your competitors, and of showing up and putting up your sleeves and getting down to work. And I believe, as I mentioned at the beginning, that you, you people who are at South By, and the places that sent you here, that you have the power to build a world that we all want to live in. We're not beholden to all of these other companies. We can decide that we want something different. And, and I think that you have the power to make some good, reasonable changes. Now, I've, yep, clap, that's good. I like the applause. All right. I have made connections in the last hour or so between 26 tech trends, OK? Which means that you only have 289 to go. <laughs> All right? Uh, so we have some work to do, and I would like for you to get started right away. My clicker may die. So here are two links, two links to share. Hopefully, I'm tweeting them. If not, I'm about to show them. This is the trend report. I wasn't joking. There are 289 more trends that I would like for you to spend some time with. This is enormous. Um, and here's the link. So it's a bit.ly link. It's case sensitive, the capitalization. It's simple, FTI 2019 tech trends. Everything, it, so it'll send you to a link where you'll download it on a WeTransfer site so that our server doesn't crash. There's a ton here. So there's a whole section on blockchains and cryptos with a primer to help everybody in your organization understand what the hell all of that is. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff. There's a, a section on security and privacy and data. Uh, there's also, some glossaries. Uh, there are some amazing scenarios on things like virtual reality and esports, which we're covering for the first time. I'm just talking so that everybody's got that link. All right. Uh, and there's also a, um, a calendar uh, for the entire year that tells you all different things that are happening to pay attention to. This is the second link. So the second link is a Dropbox folder full of free research and tools that I am not joking. You can take and reshape and use as your own with whatever work that you do. This is all stuff that I'm putting out there so that you can use. Um, I had some amazing co-authors. Uh, I work with a lot of my former and current students at NYU uh, who helped with the research. Um, our creative director 
The report looks amazing this year. Was 38 weeks pregnant when she worked on this so ladies can get stuff done, even if they're pregnant, right? All right, last thing. Um, you may be wondering why I didn't talk at all about artificial intelligence. Um, there's a reason for that. Everything that I mentioned today in some way had to do with AI. Uh, every scenario, uh, every company, everything up here was in some way tethered to artificial intelligence. Um, AI is a huge part of our 2019 report. It is also the subject of my new book, which is called The Big Nine, about the big nine companies that control the future of artificial intelligence, and I think as a result, uh, the future of humanity. And I would love to talk more about uh, that or the trend report with you. So for those of you who want, I'm going to head over right now to the bookstore. Uh, I'll be signing books, or I can also just take questions that you might have about this year's report. Thank you. I will see you next year.